some things that I like to really, I mean, it's all been great this week. Don't get me wrong. But there's some things that, you know, when I, when I do an interview for Life Today and, and you know, it's, it's, it's a good spiritual testimony or study or whatever, um, I love those, love those. And then I go to lunch and I sit there and I read the news on my phone and I'm like, what is going on in our country <laughs> right now? Well, we're going to talk about what's going on in our country, and it does affect it's a lot similar issues in some other countries. So, uh, you know, if you're in Canada, Australia, still good information, even though, yeah, we are talking about what's going on in our country. So I have a gentleman with me today. Uh, he is an attorney. He is uh, one of the co-founders of the Tea Party. Uh, remember that one. Great organization. He is also a, a business, ex business executive, uh, political activist. Currently, he is serving as the president of of what's called the Convention of States Action. And thank you, Mark Levin, the great one, for explaining to me what a Convention of States is. If you don't know, we're going to tell you. But his name is Mark Meckler, and we're going to hit some of the big issues that are um, going on in our country right now, uh, including the one that's kind of got me a little riled up, which is this whole idea of a, of a COVID passport. Because, uh, and, and I, know, I know I raised some ire on Tuesday with my very pro vaccine friend Curtis Chang and he made he laid out his case for for getting a vaccine I'm still a little leery I want to get through this first phase of mass human trials and then we'll see uh, because I'm not at risk uh, and, and I'm okay if you get it don't get me wrong but I, I what I don't like is the idea of a COVID passport there's other issues going on we got a mess on our Texas border right now breaks my heart what's going on down there it's not good for people uh second amendment rights uh, are big right now we're gonna hit them all and so i've got an expert here you guys are invited to be a part of the conversation if you're watching live jump in on the chat if you want to get any good questions i will throw them his way his name is mark meckler you may have heard of him uh and recently actually there's this op-ed in the western journal where he's talking about three ways that we can fight the vaccine passport agenda uh, and there's other big issues. So we're going to have a good time talking about it today. Mark, great to have you on Life Today Live. Really good to be with you. Thanks for having me. So if we can start with this, this va the COVID vaccine, I know that this, the Second Amendment issues are really big right now. And, of course, the border. I don't know if people really understand what's going on on our Texas border um, and other states as well. But it's really a mess right here, here right now. And it's not about keeping people out. It's so much bigger than that. But let's start with this COVID passport idea. Um, one way I like to ask the question is, you know, I've traveled overseas a lot and I have to get vaccines to go to, to places that we tend to go here at Life Outreach, you know, third world countries, places where they have uh, viruses and just all sorts of nasty things you don't want to get. So I get my yellow book is full. And when I get to these countries, I show them when I come back, I, I show them what's wrong with showing that you've had a, a COVID vaccine, you think? Well, so I think the main difference there between what you're describing is that it's voluntary. In other words, you don't really need to go to those countries. You're doing it because you want to engage in ministry in those countries. And and I don't want to belittle that. I mean, that that is a need, and the Lord calls us to do that. I think that's really important. But you have a choice whether you want to get those vaccines and go to those countries. Mm -hmm. Here's what's important is when we're talking about vaccine passports, what we're talking about is just the ability to engage in your regular life. And the limitations that will be placed on that potentially if you're not willing to get a vaccine and have your vaccine passport stamped. And frankly, it's going to be digital. It's going to be a digital database. So this becomes a mandatory thing. It could be that you're not allowed to go to the bank or you're not allowed to go to the grocery store. I know they're certainly talking about you, know, you won't be allowed to go to a Mavericks game or something like that if you don't have your passport stamped or carrying your digital passport. So what they're talking about is restricting your ability to just engage in your normal everyday life if you don't have a passport. And I think that's an intrusion on fundamental freedoms. <laughs> yeah, you, you think. Uh, I, I didn't, you know, I, I when I heard this originally, I thought it was just some states were like, yeah, you can't come to our state. And I was like, I don't really even restrict, uh, you know, travel like that within the United States. I get it. It's another country. You're going to Canada, you're going to Mexico, whatever. But you're, you're saying it's not just restricting travel to a different state, but literally... Can I go to a concert? Maybe can my kids go to school? I mean, is this are these hypotheticals or are these things that, that some of those who are pushing these COVID passports are actually saying? 
Yeah, they're not hypotheticals at all. These are things that are actually being said. Jeez. You're going to be not denied the ability potentially to travel from state to state. That's a fundamental constitutional right. And, and frankly, remember, it's important we always remember that we aren't granted any rights by our Constitution. Those are rights given to us by God. They're natural law rights. And so the Constitution is intended to protect those. We have a right to travel, in interstate travel specifically. So limiting that right based on forcing you to put a substance in your body, it's a pretty outrageous idea. The idea, literally, you couldn't, if they leave the, this in the hands of private businesses, that private businesses could keep you out, the pharmacy could keep you out, the grocery store could keep you out, doctor's offices could keep you out. And I just think it's an outrageous intrusion. And I think we need to understand how outrageous it is. It goes to the level of intrusion that you would see, for example, in communist China. Communist China has a system of social credits. If you do the things that the regime says that you're supposed to do, if you speak the way they say, act the way they say, post on social media the way they say, your social credit is high. And that means you have more privilege in society than if you don't. That's what we're headed towards. And people need to be very concerned and cautious about it. Yeah, and you know, I know some people think, well, that's China, that's kind of crazy, but that is actually going on. And when he says social credit, it means like if you want to go get an apartment, uh, you know, or get a loan or, or anything that you need to do, you have to have a certain, it's like your credit score here. It's like, oh, well, you can't get that because your credit score is not. The social credit score works the same way. I mean, this is, it sounds Orwellian, it is going on, and it is being talked about in the halls of power. Even in our country, I don't know, Canada's in some ways even worse. And we got some people watching from Canada right now, and they're they're having to deal with it. What do we do about this? Okay, I think there are multiple layers of things we can do about it. The very first thing that we can do, we always should do, everybody says it, most people don't do it, is we should call, especially our state legislators. Uh, the federal government right now has said that they're not going to do this. I don't believe they have the power to do it. It doesn't mean they won't, and I don't believe that they won't. But really, this is being fought, this battle at the state level, and that's where you have the most power. So wherever you're watching, you should call your state level officials, your members of the House, the Senate, the governor, the lieutenant governor, and tell them absolutely not, no way. And not only that, if, if you're like us, if you share our belief system, which obviously you're watching, you probably do, then you should let them know you not only want them not to do it, you want them to prohibit it. My personal opinion in looking at anybody that will be running for office in 2022 is did they put forward legislation to prohibit the use of vaccine passports in their state. And it's important that it's a broad prohibition. We're seeing various governors step up, Missouri stepped up, Florida stepped up, Texas stepped up. It's important that we read what they've done. And I'm gonna give you the most specific and most important example. Ron DeSantis has been leading the way in Florida on a lot of this stuff. And DeSantis issued an executive order and that executive order specifically prohibits the government from engaging in any of this activity. But then secondarily, and I think as important, as he said, no private business can require this. You can't be prohibited from going to the doctor or the grocery store or a concert venue because you don't have a vaccine. Here in Texas, one of the problems, and we need to be careful of this, is what I call fake conservatism, fake uh, support of liberty. Uh, Governor Abbott signed an executive order, good on the level of the government. It said the government's not gonna use these, promote these or allow these but he allowed, it still allows the private sector to do it. And I think that's very dangerous. The primary job of government is to protect our liberties. Our liberties, again, are God given. They belong to us. They weren't given to us by government. They can't be taken away by government and government should protect them. And in Texas, we haven't done that. So I think wherever you are, you should call the governor, the Lieutenant governor, your state legislators and let them know, we want them to prohibit the use of vaccine passports. So that's the first and primary level in my opinion. And something that, yeah, you're right. It's easy to do. Go online. You can find your representative if you don't know uh, who, who it is. A lot, a lot of times we don't know who our state reps are, but we can. And also, I'm going to put up the URL for your website because you've got a lot of great information in, in helping people. It's conventionofstates.com, conventionofstates.com. That's in the chat right now if you've got chat enabled. Uh, but I, there, there's part of me that that, that is a little... I don't know, pessimistic in my old age of, of like, yeah, I can refuse to do something, you know, like I'm, I'm not going to get a vaccine. And I'm not saying I, I won't. Right now, I'm not. But um, it, it's not like a – but the, the passport thing, it's like, yeah, I'm not doing that. But <laughs> when it starts – when you can't live your normal life, 
how do you? I mean, what, how do you, how do you even stand against something that big as an individual, other than calling your reps? I mean, do we do we start just going to jail in mass quantities, which they can't keep us in jail because of COVID? So maybe that works. It's just to walk through <laughs> the internet. I don't know. I don't yeah, know. I mean, so generally speaking, my answer is yes. I think there is a primary character trait in in the American heritage that is a little bit forgotten nowadays and I don't like it. I, I put on a nice shirt and a coat before I, I came on the show with you, but I was actually wearing my favorite t-shirt, which is a convention of Tate's, states t-shirt that says defiant. on it. This is a primary American character trait and it's unusual. The rest of the world mostly isn't like this. We don't have this built into our cultural or national DNA. This nation was born because a bunch of people defied the crown, defied English authority said, we're not going to allow you to tell us what to do. We're not going to allow you to tax us without representation. They were a self-governing citizenry. They had free freedom of will, right? Free will based on a gift from the Lord. The Lord gave us that. And they exercised it through this attitude of defiance. And that attitude has done very well for us over the centuries. And we're starting to lose that. We're becoming sheep, right? And, and we just go along and we don't want the hassle. And so my attitude is no. I'm willing to have the hassle. And I'll give you a, a personal example. I travel a lot. And so as I travel around, I'm flying through airports all over the country. Uh, last week, I have had to fly out to North Carolina. Next week, I'll be flying to South Carolina. I went into the airport, and there's a mask mandate in the airports, right? These are federally governed authorities. I don't believe the president had the authority to put that mandate in place. So I walk into the airport. I don't have a mask on. I walk up to the counter. Nobody says anything. I go through TSA. Nobody said anything. But I was the only person in the airport. I wore it on the airplane because otherwise I'll get thrown off the airplane. I was the only person in the airport not wearing a mask. And I didn't wear a mask in Austin. And I, I flew through Houston. I didn't wear a mask in Houston. I, I flew into Raleigh. I didn't wear a mask in Raleigh. And I did the same thing all the way home. At one point, one TSA agent asked me to put on a mask. I'm not going to be a jerk. Like, so if somebody's going to like make a scene, I'll put on a mask for a few minutes. I don't really care. And then I just took it off again. But so that's the attitude of defiance. And what happens is I saw people looking at me, not with the stink eye so much, but like, hey, that guy's not wearing a mask. Maybe I don't have to wear a mask. I saw I listened to a guy talking to his wife, like, why do I have to wear a mask if that guy's not wearing a mask? And so this is what we need to do. Somebody needs to start doing those things and just saying, no, I go into the grocery store here in Texas. The biggest grocery store chain is HEB. They said when the governor removed the mask mandates, they were going to do the same. They haven't. Huge signs out front, mask mandate that people handing out masks. I walk in, the person says, would you like a mask? And I say, no, thank you. And I shop. So I think we have to practice this attitude of defiance, always being polite. Like if somebody really gets on me, I'm not going to make a scene. I'm not going to go to war over wearing a mask for a few minutes, but I am willing to step up and be defiant. I'm willing to be uncomfortable because somebody calls me out. That's the attitude of defiance we have to have when people try to do this kind of stuff to us. Yeah. And I think that's exactly right. And I love that you do it with a smile. Uh, but so, yeah, I mean, no, in that, that's, I've experienced the same thing. I mean, I'm in, in, I'm in Lowe's, uh, just well, yesterday, day before. And I'm like, okay, that guy didn't have a mask on. That guy didn't have a mask on. I don't know. Maybe they, they've got the vaccine. Yeah. And, but the, you, you're right. It does make you start thinking, okay. And, yeah. Okay. So great suggestion. I want to move on. I want you to explain one thing though. And for people that just popped in, we're talking to Mark Meckler, uh, and this is, uh, his website. This is um, the convention of states.com, uh, and I'm popping around here. Sorry, there's uh, he's the Mark Merkler is the, the president of the convention of states action. And briefly, I don't want to get too bogged down in this because I really want to talk about uh, the, the second amendment issues and the border before we're out of here. But explain what, in short terms, a convention of states is because one of your action points is get involved yep. in the convention of states. So it really is the ultimate act of defiance. When the Constitution was written on September 15th, 1787, two days before the end of convention, Colonel George Mason from Virginia stood up, he addressed the men assembled, and he said, we've made a really bad mistake. We gave the power to the federal government to propose amendments if they thought they were necessary, but we didn't give the same power to the people acting through the states. And then he asked a question. He said, are we so naive that we believe that a government that becomes a tyranny will propose amendments to restrain its own tyranny? Now that's ridiculous. We, we have no evidence of that ever happening in human history. And it was so obvious to the founders that Madison's notes reflect two Latin words, abbreviations actually, nincom, which 
between no comment. In other words, nobody argued with this proposition. Not one person argued. And in fact, they unanimously adopted the second clause of Article 5, which says that we as states, as citizens of the states, have the power to call a convention of states to propose amendments to restrain federal tyranny. Now, I would guess that among your listeners, there is nobody that doesn't believe that we have federal tyranny now, that they've overreached, they're outside the bounds of the Constitution, they're telling us to do things, they're, they're giving us rulings on marriage, on what kind of car we can drive, on just crazy stuff, like how you can use your own land, they're limiting our ability to keep and bear arms, just crazy things they were never intended to do. So what do we do? And the answer is, call a convention of states. It takes two thirds of states or 34 states to get into convention, actually call for a convention along the same lines. It takes uh, just over half, 26 states to pass something out of convention to make a suggestion to the states for an amendment to the constitution. And then it takes 38 states to ratify. And the things that we're talking about that are in our resolution, number one, anything that would impose fiscal restraints on the federal government, like a balanced budget amendment. Number two, anything that would impose term limits on the federal government that would include Congress, it would also include unelected officials like bureaucrats and staffers, really important, the deep state. And then number three is anything that would impose scope or jurisdictional limits on the federal government. In other words, saying, for example, really important and popular, you can't be involved in education. Federal government was never meant to be involved in education. It was always meant to be a state or local issue. And so these are the things we're doing currently, 5 million people involved around the country. There are representatives of convention of states in every single state legislative district in the country. People can sign up by going to conventionofstates.com, sign the petition, click on the Take Action tab and volunteer. Last weekend alone, just over the weekend, our tech team was freaking out. They thought maybe we had a hack. Over 10,000 people signed up last weekend. No advertising, no nothing, because people want to know what's the plan, what can we do to reclaim our nation? This is the plan for reclaiming the nation conventionofstates.com, do check that out. And and I'm guessing that the reason you saw a recent spike is because of this use of executive action by presidents, which used to be for, for just completely innocuous things, you know, declaring half mast in honor of somebody or just just random kind of really just mild things, but it's, it's ramped up. And, you know, Trump did it, so I'm not being partisan here. Trump did it. Obama did it. I don't remember how much uh, George Bush the Younger did it on serious matters, you know. Uh, but now it's like it's like the president. The, it, the trend I'm seeing in my lifetime is the president is moving more and more to uh, this. I don't want to say dictator because that implies negative uh, desires, but it's just that they're moving towards more and more power in the president's hands. And it goes back and forth as we elect a Republican or Democrat. Right. And I don't like it either way, uh, honestly. Uh, and now uh, Biden or his, his caretakers are proposing these uh, Second Amendment restrictions. And I don't, man, th- this one gets me nervous because I know a lot of even conservatives and good you know, Christians don't like guns in general because they're not familiar with them. They didn't grow up with them. Uh, and, and you can hurt somebody with them. Um, Catch us up on what's going on in the Second Amendment and some of the pushback that I do like I'm, I'm seeing out of the states. Yeah, I'm really concerned about this. And, and by the way, for those who didn't grow up with guns or are uncomfortable, don't like guns, look, I understand that. I, I totally get that. I understand that more people were killed by far in the United States with blunt objects than guns last year or in any given year. And, and when I say blunt objects, I mean these, hands, <laughs> yeah. right? Fists, yeah. I mean baseball bats, mm-hmm. two by fours. And so the idea that we're going to control violence in the country by controlling the weapons, well, the weapon of choice for most people to get killed is, is bare hands, literally, or blunt objects. And so you, you can't fix crime by taking away people's Second Amendment rights. And right now, what the president's doing is, is I think what he's ultimately working towards is the ban of assault, what they call assault rifles, which there is no such thing as an assault rifle, really. If you look at the definitions, it means a rifle that looks scary. And so... It's just a weird thing. And what they're doing right now specifically is he's promoting what they call red flag laws. A red flag law allows them to come in in an unconstitutional way, in my opinion, and take your guns away from you without due process, without actual specific process to make sure that there's actually something wrong. Somebody makes a complaint and says, 
hey, that Randy guy, he's pretty crazy. You know, he comes on the air sometimes, he says crazy things. I've heard he likes guns, and so we need to go take his guns away. And we'll do a hearing later. And th this is not due process. It's very dangerous stuff. The president has come out in support of warrantless intrusions into people's houses to take their guns away from them. It's just really outrageous stuff. Another thing that they're talking about right now is they're talking about what are called ghost guns. I, I use the scary air quotes here. So my family, we're, we're firearms hobbyists. We like to build guns. So one of the things you can do is you can buy blocks of metal. This is literally what this is. It's a block of metal. It's not a weapon. It cannot be used as a weapon. I mean, I guess you could throw it at somebody, but usually they're billeted aluminum. So they're not even that heavy. They're not really going to hurt anybody. And they're now going to turn those into registered firearms and say that you need to to own that block of metal, you have to do a background check, right? You have to go through all this registry stuff. It's really crazy. And what that means, by the way, is if a piece like that can require a background check, then so can a sling that you would carry over your shoulder. Uh, so can a barrel shroud. So can a trigger. So can a just a hand grip. Or like they can make everything. And, and the goal really is to make it so that they don't want people to be able to be hobbyists like me and build firearms. And they ultimately want to make that illegal. So these are outrageous intrusions into our Second Amendment rights. And I just, I want to remind people for clarity what the Second Amendment it says. It says that the government shall not infringe on the right to keep and bear arms. It's not complicated. It doesn't say shall infringe reasonably. It doesn't say shall only infringe if people are scared. It doesn't say shall infringe on things that seem really scary to people who are unfamiliar with guns. It says shall not infringe. These are clearly infringements. And what I'm seeing, what I like is I'm seeing states push back against this. Alaska saying they're, they're a second amendment sanctuary state and they won't enforce any of these things. They won't spend law enforcement money doing it. Governor Abbott here in Texas came out with a very strong statement about this. And, and I'm hoping that he follows through as strongly as, as he spoke, saying that we should pass a sanctuary law here, saying that. So we're seeing this in more and more states. And I'm hopeful about that because this is the right level for the pushback to come from. It's not a federal government fight. This is a fight where we, the citizens, cause our elected officials to rise up against the federal government and push back. So it does make me hopeful that that's going on. Yeah, I hope so, too. And you know what? I know there's the most I think the most misunderstood phrase in the Constitution or in the uh, in the Bill of Rights, rather, is this idea of a well-regulated militia. I'm betting that you understand the terminology as it was written at the time. Explain what a well-regulated militia is. Yeah, no, this is so interesting because I think there's a que that begets a question like the question is, who was in the militia at the time that they talked about that, that that phraseology was coined? And the answer is every male was in the militia, everybody. And so, you know, unfortunately, women were treated differently back then. So it didn't include women, but the male was the representative of the family. So what this meant is every male of legal age was in the militia and was expected to keep and know how to use and bear firearms. This is a very normal concept to everybody. And it was not, you know, people on the left will tell you, well, that was for hunting. And that's ridiculous. A, a militia had nothing to do with hunt, hunting. What a militia had to do with two things. It was first and foremost to protect the people from the government. And how do we know this? Because there's a history. And one of the things that the British tried to do was disarm the American populace so they could control them and so they could keep them down. They took ammunition away, weapons away, gunpowder away, right? And so this was specifically intended as armaments against the government. It was secondarily, by the way, as armaments against federal or uh, outside invasion, but primarily it was to protect us from our own government. And frankly, I think today we're in a pretty good shape there. There are at least 300 billion weapons in America. Some people say over a billion weapons in America. It's, it's why, by the way, that no foreign nation ever has or ever will invade the United States landmass because we're all armed or, or the majority of us are armed. And we're seeing more and more of this, Randy, and I'm, I'm very excited about this too. What we're seeing is over the last four years, we've seen record sales of guns and record numbers of people going through their first background check and record numbers of people getting training for the first time. First time gun owners, last year, I believe there were 8 million first time firearm purchases, which is absolutely incredible. It's good that people are exercising their second amendment rights. And you know the the, the idea of well regulated. If you look that up in a seventeen mid seventeen hundreds dictionary, the phrase well regulated it doesn't mean restricted. It has nothing to do with what we think of today as regulations. The the, the phrase that they use to to 
illustrate what the phrase means at the time is a well-regulated clock. It means functioning properly. It literally is not saying that we should restrict uh, the, the firearms in the hands of the people. It means that the people should have know how to use them well and use them properly. So it's... Uh, yeah, you know, I love that. I think that's really important. People talk about interstate commerce and the Commerce Clause, and the term regulate is in there, to regulate interstate commerce. And what it meant in regard to interstate commerce was to smooth it out and to make it work, right? So they actually, yeah. back in 1787, if you'd use the word regulate, they actually didn't have regulations. <laughs> there was no federal register. The idea that there would be hundreds or thousands of pages of regulations governing people's lives would have been anathema to them. They, they wouldn't have understood it. And so it's really important as people who are textualists or originalists that we actually look at the context of the times that the words were written in, understand the definitions. That's the only way to appropriately interpret our constitution or anything that took place historically. Yep, 100% right. Uh, and and we've got to get back to that. All right, last thing I want to talk about, because this this weighs heavy on my heart because it, it's, a, it's a, a human rights issue in, in a sense. And right now the cartels are getting rich, trafficking people through Mexico, uh, and they're distracting our border law enforcement with loads of people, or literally, as we saw recently, dropping children over 14-foot walls, which is child abuse. Um, and, and when they do that, that frees them up to bring drugs across the border a few miles you know, down because all law enforcement has gone to where this mass influx of people are. The idea of we're going to let children come in, uh, just, just come on in. We're separating families because of the border. We're depleting those nations, and a lot of people don't realize this, but this has been going on for years because I've been all over Central, Central America, Mexico, and Central America. We're depleting them of one of their most important assets, and that is a labor force in their country. And I love these people. You and I are in Texas. We grew up. Uh, you know, Texas was part of Mexico at one point. I love these people. Literally have some working at my house this week. They don't speak English. Unfortunately, I speak enough Spanish so we can communicate. They're the best, some of the best working people in the country. They have an incredible work ethic. They stay out of trouble because they don't want to get in trouble. They're sending the money home because they love their family and want to support their family. But we're tearing people apart, tearing families apart, tearing communities apart, weakening our neighbors to the south through our border policy. It drives me insane. Give me a little take on what you're seeing down there and what we can do about it, if anything. Yeah, look, I think as a Texan, we see it more closely. Yeah. And, and there's there's something I want to say up front, which you hit on, and I don't hear enough people say this. Texas is the true, fully integrated, multi-ethnic state. If you go to the Alamo, at least half of the surnames on the Alamo there on the monument are Hispanic. So this is the idea that you know, people from outside Texas will think, oh, you know, those crazy Texas people are all a bunch of racists. If you've lived here long enough, you've multi-generational Texan, then your family is intermarried with Hispanic family. I mean, it's just super normal. We got family across the border. We're just, we don't understand all this stuff, like the contention between quote unquote Hispanics and Americans. There's no contention here in Texas. What's going on at the border, it, it's actually changed the way that I talk about politics. And I'm gonna say something that I'm not normally this harsh about politics. My political opponents generally, I consider them well-meaning, but uh, people who just, have the wrong ideas. They're, they're mistaken about things. They believe differently than I believe. What's going on in the border and the politics around what's going on on the border is cross the line from just well-intentioned people who believe differently from a fight between good and evil. If you look at what's going on on the border, there is sex trafficking. It's estimated that at least 30% of women who come up and, and young women who come up are raped somewhere along the way in transit incredible sex trafficking, child trafficking, chi children are being stolen from their families to be used to get people across the border. We don't even realize this word. We don't DNA test these families. That this is my child. This is why I get to come in. No, that child has been kidnapped somewhere along the way and will never be reunited with their parents. And if, if somebody supports the policies that are allowing these things to happen, the sex trafficking, the child trafficking, $14 million a day, it's estimated, the cartels are making off of human trafficking. If people don't support policies to stop that, in my opinion, we've now come to the point where this is not a political difference. This is the difference between good and evil. Good people believe that we cannot 
allow that to happen. We must stop being a magnet for that. We must complete the wall. We must enforce our border laws. Good people believe in the enforcement of the laws. If you don't believe in enforcing laws, that's not good. That's the difference between good and evil. It's the difference between order and anarchy in a society. So I think I, my personal opinion is we should call it for what it is. I'm going to call it what it is as a Christian, and I'm just going to call it evil. What's going on in the border today and our policies towards the border are evil. And so I think it's important that we speak the truth about that in a very blunt and bold way. I, do, do, when it comes to, to, to Biden, and yeah, I, I get it. I didn't vote for him. You know, disagree with him. But part of me is, is just baffled because it, it's one thing to say, you know, hey, look, these people are economic refugees. They are. They're poor. Uh, there, there is a lot of trouble in El Salvador. You know, it's dangerous down there in certain places. Uh, and there, and it's like we compassionately, we we can take them in. We, you know, we can we build a labor force. Um, we can be a positive thing for people from all over Central America, Mexico, and Central America. Um, that's one thing. And I get that. Now I may disagree with how we go about that. I think you should apply for asylum in in your own country first that's what we have in you know embassies for instead of making this dangerous trek across mexico with cartels where girls are getting raped people are getting robbed people are dead ranchers are, are finding bodies along the border right now uh of people are dying and it hadn't even gotten hot yet it's just going to get worse uh it, you know like you said children being used and a bit there's a point where you go okay you, what you're doing is just it, it it goes against the rhetoric of being compassionate in what you want to do. And I, I'm I'm baffled because I, I, I don't understand what the what's going on with the Biden administration in their minds where they're not seeing, oh excuse me, oh crap, what have we done? We gotta hurry and, and change this to fix it because people are being harmed. And so the compassion argument has gone completely out the window with me. And I'm, I'm trying to figure out, what are they, are, are they trying to, do they really think all these people are going to automatically vote Democrat? Because most of them are conservative. A lot of them are strong Catholics. They're not going to like the some of the other policies of, of the Democrats right now. Do they think they're going to get a voter block? Or are they trying to flood uh Texas and make them pay for it, which they are asking us to do as a form of punishment for not voting. For, I, I don't I don't get it. Do you have any <laughs> can you help me get into their brains at all and, and say what the what the heck are they thinking with this? Yeah, I think at a high level they consider this a future voter block. And one of the things I think that we uh, as conservatives struggle with in looking at how the left looks at things. And I, I want to make a distinction between people I call honest, good hearted liberals versus the radical progressive left. That's a very different thing. And now leading the party is the radical progressive left. And they always play a very long game. So I don't think they believe that these people are going to come over in a year or two or even five years from now, this is going to be a democratic voting bloc. I think they're looking at 20 years from now and 25 years from now. And what they're going to do is they, they're going to bring these people over and then they're going to intentionally keep them on welfare. This, this is the goal. They're going to subjugate them to the system. And I'm going to, I apologize, but I'm going to say some really radical stuff here because I think blunt truth needs to be said. If we want to look at American history, uh, I'm just talking history, not opinion. The party of racism historically in the United States of America forever is the Democrat Party. Always. The Democrat Party was the party of slavery. The Democrat Party defended slavery. The Democrat Party introduced, invented the Ku Klux Klan as a military wing of the Democrat Party to lynch black people, to keep black people down. Jim Crow was an institution of the Democratic Party. Welfare was an institution, that the, the broad scale institution of welfare was an institution of the Democratic Party, now proven to keep people in generational poverty. And so the Democrat Party has always been about enslavement, in my opinion. And the modern method of enslavement in the United States of America is to keep people subjugated to, beholden to, needing the state. People who are independent, people who come in and, and they get off welfare and they don't need that, we've got a track to get them to work and off of welfare, they don't need the state. They're not necessarily going to vote Democrat. But if you can create a class that is a dependent class, 
those people will always vote Democrat. And I think that's their long-term goal for these people. Bring them in, create a whole new block of people who are dependent upon government. and They will forever ensconce the Democrats in power. I, I think that's an uphill battle because you and I know the Hispanics, especially here in Texas, and they like to own their own businesses. Yep. They like to, to be the master of their own destiny. And also they sure as heck don't like you letting boys into their daughter's locker rooms right. and showers. Uh, so if that is their long game, I think they uh, don't understand the people that are coming over the border uh, because they, they ain't on board. <laughs> but, you know, I think that's true. So that's why I think the second phase of the whole thing is to try to make us hate each other. And oh, so then yeah. what they have to do yeah, yeah. is say, oh, yeah, <clears throat> Hispanics need to hate white people and black people need to hate white people and, and gay people need to hate straight people and, and what men need to hate women. That division game and what they call it is intersectionality, right? Everybody who is not a straight white male needs to be aligned against straight white males. They'll use that hate to try and drive people against their own values into the arms of the Democratic Party. I think you're spot on on that one, spot on that one. Mark, I, I, I really appreciate your insight. Um, I invite you to come back uh, you know, anytime and, and talk about some issues as, as no doubt things may just even get worse, especially with the, the Derek Chauvin case. Who knows what's gonna happen after that? Because uh, frankly, it doesn't look good for the defense. I don't want to get into that right now. Well, that, I'll say that for another day. Uh, anything you, you want to mention that you're doing uh, a website? Maybe I didn't mention anything that, that people need. Yeah, to know two things. Us. I mean, one is go to conventionofstates.com. Get involved. It's more than a convention. It's about being an engaged grassroots activist. We'll teach you how to do that. We'll hook you up with other people in your state, in your community, so you can feel like you're part of the solution. But I always want to close with something hopeful. I think we live in very hopeful times. I know that sounds crazy. We just talked about a bunch of dark, scary stuff. Here's what I like. This is what calls warriors to the battlefield. If you watch this stuff and you're not compelled to do something, I don't understand that. I don't want to be alive any other time in history. I want to be alive right now. And I feel called to the fight. I feel called to call out good and evil. I feel called to do something about good and evil. And I hope you feel the same way because a lot of people are being called to the battle right now. And so instead of just listening to Randy and me, I think it's important that you listen to stuff like this. When you finish, when we go out the air, the question is, what do I do? Not just listen, not I'll listen tomorrow, the next day. What do I do? And I would say right now, the thing that I can tell you, go get involved, go to conventionofstates.com, fill out the petition, click on the Take Action tab, and volunteer, and start your journey to the restoration of the country. Absolutely, uh, and I appreciate you saying that. And one thing I, I really would like to see pe the church doing is, you know, we don't like what's going on on the border from a policy standpoint. But those are people that God loves coming across the border, and they're desperate. I would love to see, and I've seen this some, so I'm not saying it doesn't happen. I would love to see more and more churches and Christians get involved to go help these people who are coming across, whether they're coming across legally, illegally. Absolutely. I don't care. From a Christian stand, a Christ standpoint, these are people that God loves, and if we need to reach out for them because the left is reaching out to try to claim them for their own power purposes. And I think the church should say, no, we're going we're to claim them for Christ. My two cents. Thanks again, Mark. <laughs> God bless. Great being with you. Man. All right. Thank you. I appreciate you guys hanging out, watching a little Life Today Live. This is a great one to share. If you haven't followed or subscribed any of the Life Today channels, all the Life Today TV channels, that's our handle, Life Today TV. Subscribe now, follow now, hit share, and come back next week. We've got more great interviews, and uh, I look forward to talking with you and bringing them to you. See you again next time here on Life Today Live. Make America a better nation. All we say to America. Be true to what you said on paper.